right, thanks, welcome back. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker tonight. This is Dr. Ann Arends. Uh, Annie is a board certified in emergency medicine and is a medical toxicology fellow at the University of California, San Francisco. She completed her medical, sc her medical school training at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities School of Medicine and her emergency medicine training at the Denver Health Residency in Emergency Medicine in emergency medicine. Her research interests include drugs of abuse surveillance and the treatment of severe alcohol withdrawal. And with that brief, short, sweet intro, please welcome Ann. Thank you. Good evening. So I'm Ann Arn, so I, you can call me Annie, every, all my friends do, my mom does. Um, so what I'm gonna talk to you about is chelation. So when you come to us as toxicologists, when you come to your physician and you say, I need detox, I need chelation, this is what I think I need. This is from our perspective, what we do when we talk about chelation. So just quick disclosures, everything boring. I have no conflicts of interest, nobody paid me to be here, and I, uh, nobody pays me to do anything fun, except be a doctor. So I'm not big pharma, much to my dismay. Um, so a little bit about chelation. So here's kind of the roadmap for the things I'm gonna talk about. I've got about a half hour. You can hear all my O's from Minnesota starting to come out. Um, so I've got about a half hour, so I apologize. I talk really quickly, stop me at any point if I'm talking too fast. Um, and I, you're gonna get a gloss overview and you're always welcome to ask me questions afterwards. So perspective, so you're gonna hear from our perspective as toxicologists and as medical physicians, how we approach chelation therapy, um, how we assess toxicity and the folks who need chelation therapy, who should be treated in particular, um, and then some of the harmful effects that we see from the chelation therapies that we use in medical toxicology. So like I said, as a medical toxicologist, a lot of what I do is A, public health, and B, a lot of what we do is actually seeing acute overdoses and acute intoxications, acute poisonings from the community. So um, chemical spills, people that are exposed to chemicals, people that take too many of their medications for whatever reason, people that are exposed to envenomations. I hate scorpions, they're ugly and they cause problems. Amnita mushrooms, just don't go out and pick mushrooms. They all cause problems, right? Um, so that's part of what I do. My specific area of research is in uh, drugs of abuse, particularly at sort of the, um, the greater music festivals, those kind of things. What are people using? How are they synthesizing it? What happens long term when people are using drugs? So we're finding more and more that kids that are using um, some of the synthetic cannabinoids, AKA the synthetic pots, those kind of things, we're finding that they're having some long term psychological and neurocognitive effects as a, as a result. Um, so like I said, part of what we do on top of all those things, if you take too much of your medications at home, is look at some of the environmental toxins and that's where chelation therapy comes into play. I wanna give you a disclaimer about our perspective for chelation therapy. What I'm gonna to talk to you about in particular for chelation therapy is how we as medical toxicologists use chelation therapy. Right, so we're gonna talk about how we approach it, how we see it, and how we use it. And that comes into part, sort of part of uh, our mission as medical toxicologists. So we work a lot with the ACMT, which is the American College of Medical Toxicology, um, as well as our national organization, the NACCT. Um, so what we do is we're part of the Choosing Wisely campaign. So the American Board of Internal Medicine put together a campaign is let's stop, let's take a look at our medical therapies, and let's review some of the things that we do that can be harmful to patients. Are we testing things that we don't need to test for? Are we treating things that we don't need to treat? Um, so those are part of the, some of the things that come up in the setting of toxicologists for chelation therapy. So some of the things that we found that are not helpful in treating patients, and sometimes we've actually been harmful in treating patients and testing things that don't need to be tested or treating things that don't need to be treated. Um, so chelating agents, people are giving chelating agents as in the prescription chelation agents. Um, prior to testing for metals, as in provoked urine testing that you might be familiar with. So as Dr. Shade had recommended, we test you for metals, we give you a chelator, and then we test you for metals again. And then we treat you as if you had a, medical, a metal intoxication. So then we found that that's inappropriate. Ordering heavy metal screening, so broad heavy metal screening on folks who have nonspecific symptoms that are not tied to a specific metal tox toxicologic exposure. So in the absence of a specific specific either sign or symptom of a metal toxic toxicologic exposure, we'll say it that way, um, treating those folks. Um, chelation therapy, again, outside of toxicology that hasn't been validated by a proper test. So 
Hair testing, this is very important, particularly for epidemi epidemiologic studies. This is very important. However, if you're sending hair for heavy metals, remember that we live in a society, we live in an age where there are toxic metals all over the place. You're going to have metals that are on your hair. It does not mean that it has been incorporated into your body, right? So I wash my hair all the time. This is not my natural hair color, right? You take some really strong chemicals to get my hair this color. If you were to test my hair, you would find a whole host of different sort of metals, other sort of agents that are on my hair but not in my body. So that's very important to remember. And dental amalgams, I'll touch on a little bit. We've talked about a couple times today. So we have not found that removing dental amalgams actually decrease your, lead, your mercury burden and can actually, as they're removed, can actually increase your exposure to mercury. So if you have questions about that, we can talk about the, that a little more. So as we talk about the history of chelation therapy, where did this come from? So again, we're talking about our, our prescription chelations. So uh, in World War I, right before World War I, um, there, were some, there were some chemical testings that were completed, and they were, what they were looking for are some chemical agents. So these are mostly the sort of mustard gases that they could use um, against their opponents. So what they had determined, or what they had uh, created, was lewisite, which might be something that you might be familiar with. So this was, this was created and was finally weaponized right before World War I, but was never used in World War I, and actually was finally ready to go by World War II, was actually never used. So this is a blistering agent, and this is lewisite. Um, so this is how our first chelator came to be. So this is BAL, or British anti-lewisite. The way that uh, lewisite acts as a blistering agent, as we kind of talked about, so it does interfere with these sulfhydro groups. Um, and the way that the British anti-lewisite, I'm going to blow through this a little bit, what it does is essentially makes it a non-toxic agent, creates this very stable five-membered ring that your body is able to sort of rid. And so that became part of World War II. Um, these became part of their sort of medical kits, and so you can't really read it. But on the far end, on your left, you'll see that there's some eye drops that have the British anti-lewisite. And so this was given to all the soldiers to carry with them. Um, so as time sort of progressed from 1945 to 1947, they found that the British anti-lewisite was not only effective in arsenic poisoning, but but also in industrial accidents for arsenic poisoning, uh, mercury toxicity, as well as some gold antimony. Um, gold was a classical treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, and they found in toxicity that this was a very effective chelator. Now, sort of bringing it to the modern medical world, um, looking through the CDC, so this is a, a a, an organization that most people are most familiar with now with the Ebola um, outbreak. So we find more than 100,000 Americans are uh, treated with chelation every year. Um, there are 11 different FDA-approved chelation therapies, and I won't go through them in, in great detail, um, but there are others that are available through compounding pharmacies and also online resources. Um, what is it? So what is chelation therapy when we talk about it? So chelate actually comes from the Greek word chely, if I'm saying it right, or chely, which refers to the great claw of crustaceans. And so what it does is you can kind of see is it literally binds to those metal atoms, so on either side. And then your body makes it more bioavailable for your body to rid, either through your kidneys, so urinary excretion, or through the feces. Um, these are, and uh, again, I'll just kind of uh, gloss over these, um, the FDA-approved chelators. So like I said, there's 11 FDA-approved chelators. The ones that are used most frequently in the United States are BAL, um, the calcium EDTA, as I'll refer to it as, um, succimer, and defuroxamine. And just briefly, these are the things that they're approved for treating. So lead, mostly you're going to see it for lead toxicity, arsenic, mercury, um, gold. We don't see a whole lot of gold toxicity any longer. Um, it's one of my favorites because it just sounds really cool, but we just don't see it very much anymore. Um, and then, of course, iron toxicity and lead. Um, what do we know and what do we see as the utility of chelation therapy? So when do we use it? So in the correct cl clinical setting. So for example, um, somebody who is trying to um, smelt lead using mercury, they have a big you know, inhalational exposure to vapor um, with an appropriate clinical exam and also clinical laboratories to confirm that exposure. Um, most commonly, the things that we treat as medical toxicologists from the poison center, so we, the most calls that we see and we chelate are mercury, lead, arsenic, and iron 
iron. And again, these are usually in acute poisonings, acute overdoses, or acute exposures. Um, the chelation therapy, what we tend not to use it for, um, are sort of these vague symptoms. So we don't want to give you something that has these prescription chelators do have pretty significant side effects and can be very dangerous. So we do not treat them for vague symptoms with no known exposure. Um, provoked urinary testing, we're finding, does not correlate with body burden levels. And also things like heart disease, if you've heard of the TACT trial you may be familiar with. Um, at this point, we don't have enough information. And we find that for autism spectrum disorders, these sorts of chelators are not effective. Um, so how do I approach it as a, as a medical toxicologist as far as determining toxicity? Again, it comes down to clinical exam, your exposure history, and then laboratory confirmation if it's available. And I just want to say briefly how we determine what's normal. So we don't usually talk about what's normal, right? So again, my hair, right? Not normal. But we're talking about reference ranges. So if you remember the bell curve from school, if you remember how you were graded and always made me mad, um, so if you remember on the bell curve, everything's on a curve. So some people may live here, and some people may very little live here. So how we determine these reference ranges, not necessarily the normals, are you looking at population-wide. So NHANES, if you're familiar with this organization, so this is an offshoot of the CDC. And what the NHANES studies do is they look through um, the entire United States population ages two months and older. They go through the entire country, all 50 states, and they break it down. Um, it's a little complicated, but they break it down by essentially counties, households, and then individuals. And what they do is they do really rigorous um, interviews. They do blood testing. They do urinary testing. They do fit testing. So this is how you can look up the exact rate of dental caries in females ages 6 to 11, right? So this is how we get all of our public health data. And this is all available online. So this is where we get our sort of reference ranges. Um, so if you're looking, this is specifically for mercury. So you can see uh, the specific urinary, this is over, this is spot urine mercury um, for different age groups, different populations, different socioeconomic statuses as well. So that's where when we're talking about reference ranges or normal ranges, that's how we get this information. Information. So it may, for each individual person, may be different, but this is over an average over all the U.S. population. So that's where we get our data. So how do we approach, again, as medical toxicologists, the clinical assessment? So just briefly, we're going to touch on mercury, and I'm not going to go into any amount of detail for mercury toxicity. So again, this is going to be a glossed over view um, of our view. And again, these are acute exposures for the most part of mercury toxicity. Um, this is from the NEJM. And what's important up here, I know you can't read the words, what's important is that there's different, different flavors, different varieties of mercury, and you're exposed to them in several different ways. Um, and they also have several different effects. So elemental mercury um, is what we're used to playing with, right? It's quick, quicksilver that I was never allowed to play with as a kid. It turns out for elemental mercury, you can hold it in your hand. You can even swallow it. And it doesn't cause any problems, except in one case report where it actually sort of collected in somebody's appendix and they had to remove their appendix. Um, or if you inject it. This picture was actually somebody who injected mercury through their IV. And this is actually a perfect outline of the vessels in their uh, in their lungs, which I don't recommend, by the way. Um, but elemental mercury, you can hold, you can play with, you can touch, you can even swallow. It doesn't cause any trouble. But once it becomes vaporized, once it becomes vaporized is when you start to get toxicity. So in the acute setting, you'll see pulmonary edema. So you'll see fluid that collects in the lungs. So you have damage to those cells, and you have leaky capillaries. In chronic toxicity, this is where you see this sort of uh, acrodynia, erythism. So this is what they used to refer to as Mad Hatter's disease. So it causes neurocognitive changes. And it was this painful sort of shyness. Um, and it was this sort of odd, very intermittent, um, ag agitated behavior that we used to see. We see infrequently now that we're much more aware of those exposures. But we still see those. Um, mercury salt. So this is inorganic mercury. So these, these used to be actually used for teething powders. Uh, in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and now they're actually starting to crop up, and I'll show you some examples in skin lightening creams that were actually sold in California. And this is about 10 years or so. Um, this is what we call Pink's disease. So this is a really painful desquamating rash. And that bright pink color is the, is the color of this uh, little girl's hands who is exposed to it. Um, so in the right setting, that can suggest a, uh, a mercury exposure. This is a, one of the most famous pictures um, that I'm sure everybody has seen. And this is actually 
actually um, a child who was born in the Minamata Bay area. And if you're not familiar with the Minamata Bay disaster, there was uh, mercury that was leaked into the surrounding sea in Japan, and that was in the Minamata Bay. What happened is that uh, mercury was taken up by the shellfish and the seafood in the Minamata Bay. It was organified. The mothers who ingested that had some symptoms, very mild, maybe some neurocognitive changes. The subsequent babies who were born to them, because we know that mercury can uh, accumulate in the placenta and also crosses the placental barrier, had a cerebral palsy um, sort of um, syndrome. And that's what we saw here. And this was one of the children that was born to a mother who ate shellfish and seafood every day. That was their main sustenance in the Minamata Bay area. Um, and again, the, so that's our sort of clinical part. The exposure history is also really important. So how might you have been exposed? So the most uh, common common scenarios in which we see mercury vapor toxicity are a couple things. So A, people that are trying to um, smelt out lead. So if you were to take a bunch of um, sort of rocks that you think might have some gold in it, excuse me, gold, not lead, trying to get some gold out of it, this will actually sort of dissolve away the other chemicals and the other uh, metals as you heat them up, anything that else is in the rock, and you'll get gold from there. Problem is if you're heating up a bunch of mercury on your stovetop, which is literally where people do it, you're going to get a pretty significant elemental mercury uh, exposure exposure, excuse me. Mercury salts, so these are the inorganic mercuries. Like I said, there was an outbreak. This was in California, and I want to say Texas as well. Um, these were some skin lightening creams that were being sold um, either in the U.S., some came from Mexico um, that were imported, um, and these had a very high uh, concentration of mercury in them as well. And then the methyl mercury, so this is what we're most familiar with, right? So this is where you see your mercury levels in swordfish and tilefish um, and shark. Um, and this is why we have limitations on how much as a, as a pregnant woman in particular, um, how much seafood that you can eat. And how do we determine who needs to be treated? So again, um, like I said, so it depends on the confirmed exposure. So these are the people that we see that we're referred to that we treat. Um, and we'll tend to have, this is for mercury in particular, evidence of end organ damage or specific signs or symptoms. Um, so renal toxicity being the number one in acute tox in uh, acute uh, mercury exposure along with some of the other exposures, again, depending on your clinical signs and symptoms. Um, lab confirmation, so this is, gets to be a little bit tricky, particularly on your exposure. Um, whole blood levels are what we tend to send uh, if you're calling your uh, local poison control if you've just been uh, exposed. So in acute exposure, your whole blood mercury will best reflect your exposure. In chronic exposure, so if you're somebody who works in a factory or something like that and you're concerned about mercury exposure, a 24-hour urine collection is what we tend to look for. Um, does chelation therapy work? Now again, this is all specific to mercury. Um, this is actually really cool. So this this came from 1949. Um, so prior to the availability of uh, chelation therapy, people were just kind of treated with supportive care. So if you were exposed to mercury, we would give you some fluids, we would keep you comfortable, we would give you all the therapy that we are aware of. Um, so this was in 127 patients in total who were exposed to uh, mercuric chloride. So this was um, these little tablets that were actually coffin shaped and what they would do is either dissolve them in water and they would use it as a sort of topical anesthetic in the hospital and things like that. Um, if you were to ingest it, however, we know that you would get a hemorrhagic gastritis and pretty significant mercury toxicity. Um, so in these patients, um, for the patients who were treated with just symptomatic care, uh, 27 of those patients died of those 127. For those who got BAL therapy, zero of them died. And so that was pretty significant. Um, this is from rat studies. So this was uh, rats that were given um, pretty large doses of oral mercuric chloride um, and looking at their uh, toxicity. So after uh, chelation treatment, so BAL, DMSA, or DMPS, um, you can see how their uh, percent of mortality fell significantly with chelation therapy. So it seems to work, and that's for sure. Now the question comes down to chronic exposures. Um, now the thing that we worry most about in chronic exposures, of course, are the neurocognitive changes. Um, and so does it work? Uh, data's a little fuzzy on that. That's a little fuzzy. Um, here what we're looking at is, again, these are rats that were exposed to mercury, and this is over 14 days. They were exposed for 14 days, had a seven day break after seven days, then they were given chelation therapy for five days. And what they found is those brain mercury levels really didn't fall at all. So while their urine or their kidney, excuse me, levels did fall and their, their liver levels fell just a little bit, uh, their brain levels did not fall. So it may be that 
in those chronic intoxications, there's no effect. And we know for those methylmercury cases, A, the children received no benefit, and the people that were exposed, some of the mothers who were eating it, received no benefit from chelation therapy. So now here's the question, what can go wrong, right? So if we're treating someone, if you call, call me, you come to me as, as a medical toxicologist, um, what can go wrong? Um, so there are deaths that are associated with some of these chelator therapies. I wanna be very clear, these chelation therapies are with disodium EDTA not calcium disodium EDTA. This is a very big difference. Um, and this is how things can go wrong. So the calcium disodium EDTA, while it will bind um, whatever you're trying to chelate, it will also bind other trace minerals. So zinc that you need, calcium that you need. The sodium EDTA in particular will bind calcium. Um, so there were three deaths. So in Texas, this was a two-year-old female um, who died after receiving IV uh, sodium EDTA. This was a female who was receiving it for lead toxicity. Uh, in Pennsylvania, there was a five-year-old who was killed after inadvertently receiving uh, IV sodium EDTA, and this child was being treated for autism. Uh, there was a 53-year-old female who um, was being treated to remove met heavy metals from her body, received IV sodium T EDTA, and also died. And everyone died of uh, profound hypocalcemia, and they were unable to be uh, resuscitated. Um, again, these things are not benign, right? So BAL, this is suspended in peanut oil, so if, and it's a deep intramuscular injection. So if you receive this and you have a peanut allergy, there's no way to retrieve it, and now we have to treat you for your peanut allergy. Um, again, it's not effective for chronic mercury poisoning. This is very important. Um, and it also, um, if you give it in selenium poisoning, you've already, you've now made a complex that's even more toxic to your kidneys than it is the selenium itself. So these are all very important things. This is the calcium sodium EDTA, so not the sodium EDTA that will bind all of your calcium, but the calcium sodium EDTA. Um, this is what we will uh, tend to do for lead encephalopathy. The problem is if you give it alone for a child who has acute lead encephalopathy, it can cause life-threatening cerebral edema. So again, these are not benign therapies. Um, dimer caprol, oops, going backwards, just kidding. Um, so, and again, like I said, these can also chelate your copper, your iron. These are things that your body needs to uh, have normal function. Succimer, um, this is what we tend to use most often in children for lead poisoning. Very important that we get the, our children tested for lead and that we remove environmental sources of lead, so lead paint, while it is no longer legal in the United States, is still in old homes. Uh, and as medical toxicologists, we get referred fairly frequently for children who are still exposed to lead. Um, so this is a very important medication, but it's also important to remember that it will also chelate things like the zinc that, again, your body needs um, to undergo normal cellular mechanisms. Uh, Deferoxamine, this is what we use most often for iron toxicity. Um, this has been associated um, with some visual disturbances as well as auditory disturbances and chronic therapy. This is most often in folks who have um, medical treatments where, or medical conditions where they're receiving a lot of transfusions, so you can get iron overload that way. That's where we see this most often. Um, so this is where um, we as medical toxicologists have a duty to the public and we have a duty to not treat people that don't need to be treated as, like I said, these are medications that have serious side effects and these are also medications that can have some mortality associated with them if they fall into the wrong hands. Um, so most important uh, is that we're not chelating people unless they have a documented medical metal intoxication. This is where things become a little uncomfortable. We have no data that chelation therapy improves outcomes in autism. We're talking about these chelators that I'm referring to, our, our FDA chelators. We have no evidence that they improve outcomes in Alzheimer's disease. Um, these are very devastating diseases, but we have no data from our standpoint that giving these chelators that can be very dangerous improve outcomes, so we need to be careful who we're giving them to. Um, giving the key, this provoked urine challenge. So this is something that's come up a couple times. Um, so in the past, what's happened, um, and some of you may have seen these before, is we will test for metals, give a chelator, retest for metals. And you'll find, lo and behold, while you have very low levels in your urine, we'll give you a chelator. Afterwards, you'll have very high levels of, of a metal, whatever it be. And this is to be expected, right? We're giving you something that's going to bind and make you excrete metals. So if you 
test for metals, give something that binds, helps you excrete metals, you're going to find more metals in your urine. What's important to note for these things is that the reference ranges, again, not normal values, but the reference ranges that are quoted on these uh, reports are the reference ranges for pre-chelation. So if you look at everybody, before they receive any chelation, you're going to get a reference range for normal. Normal. Um, after you get chelation, these are no longer valid, right? So we don't know where those normal values are. So of course you're going to get an elevated level, and we don't know what to make of them. It doesn't really reflect body burden. Um, dental amalgams. Um, this is another sort of hot topic, um, sort of in toxicology. So dental amalgams, couple things. So first and foremost, after you have dental amalgams, you absolutely will have higher levels of mercury in your, in your blood. That's 100% true. Um, we know for dentists, of course, this is a main thing that we need to um, protect them from, from mercury toxicity. Because as you heat those things up, if you're removing dental amalgams, everybody's exposed to more mercury, right? The patient is exposed. The dental staff is exposed. Um, what we know is that while it may increase your blood mercury levels or your urine mercury levels, we can't tell you that it's tied to any disease. And again, this is where I become uh, very unpopular in this room. Um, so we've looked at, uh, so there's a lot of data behind this, but one of the greatest studies is over in uh, 500 children, and they actually randomized them to receive either dental amalgams that had mercury containing or just resins. Um, and they found they absolutely did have higher mean urinary mercury excretion, but in these young children, so this is again in their formative years, there was no difference in full IQ scale, um, their visual um, or motor com kind of sort of composites, their general, their general memory, and not their albumins. We don't have, yeah. So again, this is from our standpoint from toxicology. For massive effect in uh, there was, what were the, they, they had the there was I don't know if it's two, mic like is the mic still on? Score. There there was a color score, it, it was like a there was a, a visual processing mm -hmm. score. Uh, and I'll 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 send you the paper. Sure. So all the stuff that was flatlining amongst the whole population mm -hmm. Gotcha. And I'm unfamiliar with that particular paper. Um, it's from the same people who did all the Yeah. So and I'm unfamiliar with that particular study. Um, so, but from at least in my review and at least in our review, sort of in the literature and in children and adults, we're not finding that there's any significant effect. And it will have increased urinary mercury, that's for sure. Um, chelation for heart disease, this is another big thing that comes up. And I know I'm getting uncomfortable in the crowd, or I'm getting unpopular in this crowd, which is fine. So the TAC trial, the TAC trial, this is just, this is something that comes up again all the time, um, is a question that we see all the time. So this is from a JAMA study from 2013. Um, and the idea behind this is that um, chelation therapy, the idea being that you're pulling calcium out of the plaques. Um, and this was actually a positive trial, so they did find actually some utility um, with some trepidation. So what they found is when they saw in patients who'd had previous myocardial infarctions, um, once they received a chelation therapy, they did have some decreased rates of revascularization. Again, um, this was not a significant effect. It was a trend towards an effect, but there was a small effect. Um, a caution for the consumer, just to be careful if you're buying um, chelation therapy over the counter or you're buying it online or something like that, just to be careful that you can find these things online. Line, but just to be careful, remember they're not FDA um, controlled, so you never really know what you're getting in some of these. Um, 
some of the medications that we've run into, um, depending on what you buy and where you buy it, um, Ayurvedic medications and some of those other things that can be imported can have trace elements such as lead, iron, and you just got to be really careful about what you're buying. Um, so just be on the lookout for those things. Um, so in summary, again, chelation therapy is really important and it's really uh, uh, efficacious in the things that we use it for in medical toxicology. So in particular, so acute exposures, and it is really important. The important thing is to remember to choose wisely. Um, us as physicians that we're not harming our patients first and foremost. That's our number one goal. Um, so while these re are really important, we want to be careful who we're treating and how we're treating them. Um, so again, uh, poison control, we're open 24-7. If you have any concerns at any time, go ahead, give us a call. You can always talk to a medical toxicologist um, if we're on call. Um, questions? I'm sure that there are plenty. I'm willing to answer them all. Hit me. Yeah, I want to just confirm something you said about chelation yeah. therapy. I just undertook three more patients in the last month or two. Mm -hmm. One was a, a, a fellow who owns the uh, gun shooting place over at yeah. Coyote Point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, he um, actually had chelation therapy for cardiovascular, serious cardiovascular. Mm -hmm. And he had it done by a very well-known doctor here in San Jose. I'm not going to mention his name. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get him in trouble. But he actually came to me, he was almost in death. I mean, his legs swelled up double the size. He had s serious heart problems and he almost collapsed several times. Then I took on two people, with one with Lyme's disease and another one with irritable bowel leaky gut syndrome and they both were treated by chelation. Both symptoms went double, they got worse. Absolutely, one of the persons with Lyme disease was overcoming with me she went and had a treatment done in Los Gatos by someone, and it brought on the symptoms again. When I was working at UCLA with cancer patients, we used to get a lot of uh, patients from hospitals in Mexico who did chelation therapy mm -hmm. for cancer. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, we found a lot of osteoporosis, mm -hmm. severe osteoporosis mm -hmm. to the point, sure. and cardiovascular damage. So I, I r do not recommend chelation therapy in that sense, because I've seen too many of these cases and I've taken on more cancer patients recently and one just came up to me from another a local doctor with chelation therapy and she's not doing well at all. As a matter of fact, the tumors have grown double after the chelation therapy. Hi, I would like to second what Bernd just said. I've also dealt with patients who've been sick with chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia-like symptoms for years and years after getting IV chelation. I personally believe there are safer ways to chelate, and especially with chronic illness. Uh, most of, and I'm a Lyme specialist, and it's the last thing in the world I recommend for Lyme disease, although there's usually the complication of heavy metals poisoning. It definitely, it's a, he, mo these are hepatotoxins, and yeah. most of these chronically ill people have liver issues. They haven't been able to detox. And so you put in a, something that tries to force them to detox in a liver that's not detoxing, you get into very, and then it's a hepatotoxin itself, you're compounding the problem. And so I've worked with them um, detoxifying them very, mm. very slowly after they went and got chelated, where thinking they were doing themselves well. I'm a more of a naturopathic practitioner, and I believe in the baby steps, especially when you're dealing with heavy metals. Questions? Hi, I know personally a couple of people. Okay, um, my brother-in-law and his friends, they both had the triple bypass, and after th two, three years, they weren't doing so well, and they did the chelation. They're doing great right great. now, and that personal people that I really know and then there were, I used to belong to uh, International Cancer Victim Friends, and some of those cancer patients, it was like a stage four, and they did the chelation. And what else did they 
survived. So, so primarily your applications are in acute cases solely and almost never in chronic cases? No, uh, chronic cases um, we do see. Um, so we would consider a lot of the times the lead toxicities that we see, a lot of the iron toxicities, particularly in adults, um, and the mercury toxicities sort of in the industrial settings would be sort of considered chronic toxicities. Uh, the majority of the time that we get called sort of at poison control or as a medical toxicologist to see someone would be in the acute setting. That's when we tend to get involved. Well, I thought that was all fascinating information. Thank you very much. Very welcome. Very welcome. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Anna.